All right. Uh, so thank you everyone for for joining on uh, this Wednesday morning. Uh, I'm, I'm my name is Aaron Villery. If we haven't had the chance to meet yet, um, I'm the senior active transportation planner here at Dr. Cog, the Denver Regional Council of Governments. Um, there there is going to be some kind of basic background on what Dr. Cog is, just to sort of make sure we're all level set. But um, I I think I've had the chance to meet uh, many or most of you. So just want to express my appreciation to you all. Uh, for making the time today. Um, and I am going to start to share my screen. All right. Um, great. So, yeah. So, uh, 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 my name is Aaron Villery. I'm joined by my colleague, Emily Lindsay, um, who is the Active Emerging Mobility Program Manager. Um, and uh, today we're we're here to to talk about uh, Dr. Cog is updating our active transportation plan for the Denver region. So I'm going to give just a little bit of background about that, um, uh, and and kind of give you all uh, an introduction uh, to the plan. Uh, you all were invited to this because uh, you are sort of known stakeholders um, across the region uh, who are involved or interested in active transportation, or um, or we we were recommended your name um, by different uh, folks in our, our community and and uh, sort of stakeholder universe. Um, and so we really appreciate uh, we're uh, you all taking the time. We're sort of. Um, in the early stages of, of forming a community advisory group around this active transportation plan. So this is the first meeting um, of the, the community advisory group. It's really meant to give you a background on the project um, and to start to solicit some input. Uh, we are are really starting to, to roll up and, and ramp up the project. And, and so we want to uh, uh, convene stakeholders um, you know, both from our member governments and and from our larger partner and and uh, public community. So uh, I'm I'm really hoping to just gather some feedback and have a nice conversational meeting. Um, I think we're at a good size that um, that we can be pretty conversational and and uh, and definitely feel free to to chime in as as you have input. Um, so I'm gonna gonna quickly. Um, uh, just go through the agenda, and I think we can take a time because of the size. Um, Actually, I, I'm I'm going to have you all. If, if you wouldn't mind adding, if you have an organization affiliation, um, if you wouldn't mind adding that to your your name, your alias in Zoom, um, and please feel free to introduce yourselves in in the chat box. Um, and so, with that, let us dive in. Um, so the agenda for the day uh, for the day is is I want to give you all a, an introduction to the actual transportation plan for the Denver region that Dr. Cog is undertaking, give you an overview of the project, just kind of share some of the major things that we're we're working on, what the timeline is for that. Um, talk a little bit about uh, I, I think this is actually a little out of order I'm realizing, but talk a little bit about our hopes for this advisory group. Um, some sort of expectations um, about what we would like to do with this group and, and sort of make um, your time uh, uh, most, you know, well spent and worthwhile. Um, and then the, the key things that I really want to focus on are uh, we have sort of a key themes discussion exercise. Um, and this is really sort of what are the guiding themes that are important? We've, we've started to draft these with some of our member government stakeholders. Um, and so I want to uh, take some time to ground truth that with with you all and, and get some input and kind of make sure we're on the right track. Um, and then finally, talk about some next steps for engagement. Um, so with that, um, uh, I will dive right in. All right. So this is uh, an overview of, of what we're hoping to accomplish with the plan. So first of all, level setting, many of you will know this well uh, based on the, the attendee list, but uh, just want to make sure to level set. Um, what is Dr. Cog? We're the Denver Regional Council of Governments. We're a planning organization where local governments collaborate to establish guidelines, uh, set policy, and allocate funding in the areas of transportation, personal mobility, growth and development, and aging and disability resources. So we're the um, we're the MPO and regional planning uh, uh, council for the Denver region. So our um, our area that we're you know when we talk about what is the, the coverage area for this plan and, and for Dr. Cog's planning efforts. We cover nine counties plus uh, a portion of Southwest Weld County. Um, and we're made up of members. We're a member association. So uh, we work directly with cities, towns, counties, um, and, and partner agencies. Um, 
throughout the the Denver region. So um, every as as far west as uh, Clear Creek County and Gilpin County, and as far east as Adams and Arapaho, and then Douglas to the south, and of course uh, Boulder and Weld County to the north. Um, there are you know uh, we we are. Our coverage area is uh, comparable to the state of Connecticut, um, and our population uh, is comparable to the state of Utah. And of course, uh, our uh, the territory that we're on is the is the traditional um, land of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho people. Um, so we have a a diverse uh, uh, coverage area. And so, just kind of going over what are our roles, and I want to sort of use this to level set because uh, many of you uh, have. Uh, likely engaged on similar plans. Uh, because Dr. Cog is, is the Metropolitan Planning Organization and the Regional Planning Commission for the Denver area, we really operate in that field of uh, providing guidance, providing a regional framework for uh, cities and towns and counties to do their local planning work, um, in, engaging more or providing more seamless connections uh, among the different jurisdictions um, and providing a convening space. Um, so we, you know, what goes into this plan is is really a framework or guidance for local governments. Uh, Dr. Cog does not own any right of way, so we actually don't directly implement projects. However, one of our big roles is is of course allocating uh, funding through the TIP or Transportation Improvement Program uh, to local projects. So we work uh, very closely with our our local governments and jurisdictions, as well as our partners in the state and RTD. And uh, and uh, many of the folks in this call, the transportation management associations and different partners throughout the region, and and we really sort of serve in a convening role. And that's I think how we're approaching this plan is um, providing a, a regional framework for uh, active transportation. And so, what is the active transportation plan? Uh, the purpose of this plan is to update the current regional active transportation plan, which was last adopted in January 19, 2019. Much has happened in the last five and a half years. Um, so we're, we're really trying to update this plan, do a major rethink. We want to provide a vision for walking and bicycling and emerging modes of, of active transportation uh, throughout the region. We're really focusing on providing tools and guidance for local agencies to implement projects in their respective jurisdictions and to provide support. And the plan will identify actions for Dr. Cock to undertake to support these activities so this can be uh, policy changes within uh, the Regional Council of Governments, um, programmatic things that we can do to support active transportation, additional guidance um, that we can develop in the future. And so this is uh, this is really, a, you know, I, I keep using that word framework. This is a framework for the uh, for the region to provide a more cohesive system of of active transportation across the region. Um, so I want to give an example, uh, just in case you haven't seen this. Um, just to kind of make more concrete what the active transportation, the, the chief outcome of the active transportation plan is intended to be. And so this is from the 2019 plan. This is the regional active transportation network. And we we built, um, actually my uh, Emily and, and my predecessors here at uh, Dr. Cock built uh, sort of a three-part framework. And that's composed of regional active transportation corridors, which are the yellow lines, those, those sort of linear corridors. Um, where active transportation uh, is is meant to uh, be a higher comfort or higher quality uh, for travel to include more types of riders. Um, and then we have two sort of geographic district designations, which are pedestrian focus areas and short trip opportunity zones. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what those are with a local example. This is zoomed in on a sector, section of East Denver and Aurora primarily. Um, and just to show you that the plan uh, provides these regional corridors, and so these are the regionally significant uh, walk and bike corridors um, that, for instance, when we're when we're doing the transportation improvement program, um, that these would be the priorities for uh, implementing improved um, high comfort uh, walk and bike infrastructure. So this includes things like trails, but also streets and um, uh, different rights of way um, that either have existing or are planned um, for, for future improvement. Um, and then within that, because uh, walk and bike travel is so local um, and the, the sort of, you know, sweet spot is, is in that, uh, you know, less than two to three miles, um, we also developed short trip opportunity zones. And these are based on 
um, where we see short trip demand. Um, so this is based on, it was developed using Dr. Cog's regional travel model and where we think there are a lot of trips that are two miles or less um, that could really be converted to active transportation if safe and comfortable and inviting conditions exist. We did um, some statistically significant survey work uh, with the last active transportation plan to understand sort of the market for bicycling and walking and, and found um, that a lot of people have an interest in uh, using active transportation more if the infrastructure matches um, their feeling of safety and comfort. So um, we're really focusing on trip conversion with the short trip opportunity zones. And then the pedestrian focus areas really look at more demographic factors or destination and land use factors to try to understand where is there a high propensity to walk, excuse me, um, that we might want to improve the sidewalk coverage or sidewalk quality. Um, and so that three-pronged network, you can sort of see how it overlaps. Um, it, it really provides the, the framework for what Dr. Cog is um, uh, prioritizing through our, our funding um, uh, programs and also what we are working with our member jurisdictions to prioritize in their local planning work. And just to sort of show you an outcome, uh, in this section of Aurora, you can really see, um, I'll just point on the screen, that their bike network um, investments over the, you know, over the last five to 10 years often focus on densifying some of these short trip uh, opportunity zones and pedestrian focus areas. And so the outcome of this is is really trying to guide, you know, where's the uh, the most opportunity to to unlock active transportation for more people. And so you can sort of see how the investment um, uh, can really be guided by and and, and follow these these frameworks. Um, and then just to sort of show uh, in another way, Dr. Cog also tries to track regional sidewalk coverage. Uh, through some different data sources um, and you can sort of see how the opportunities to uh, improve pedestrian access um, really overlap with with maybe there's some historic sidewalks that need to be upgraded or or some gaps um, that exist from sort of the the pre-ada uh, era um, so that's the three-part network i'm going to take a pause because i've been talking for a little while um, and just see if there are any questions about specifically the project purpose or how that network is formed. And we'll have more time to um, uh, chat about this in detail as well, but I uh, just wanted to take a pause um, and please feel free to chime in as we go. Oh, sorry, I, I, I thought I was on mute. I can, if, it, if we do the hand raising thing, that's sorry. Um, has there been any consideration of identifying projects in the existing active transportation plan instead of replanning? Um, so this will be done in coordination with uh, the regional transportation plan. So that uh, this is a good question about sort of Dr. Cog's overall plan framework and, and how it all fits together. So we've kind of made the choice not to uh, plan specific project just because we don't have the jurisdiction to implement those. So um, a lot of this is refreshing um, refreshing the existing network uh, yeah, um, uh, or, or replanning um, based on, you know, either changes to local plans. Um, a lot of this is going to be, you know, sort of following uh, what is in, in local plan updates. Um, and then just understanding changes in the region over that time. The regional transportation plan, uh, which is sort of the overarching uh, framework for Dr. Cog, is the one that actually identifies those projects. So this will certainly inform the RTP uh, going forward um, and maybe used to identify some of those projects that actually has a, you know, a, a fiscally constrained project list and, and network uh, for the region. Um, and so this this is an input into that. But uh, I think the opportunity for us is, is to just sort of understand what's changed in the last five years um, and uh, to to utilize sort of some new uh, data sources and new inputs, you know, just the thing that we look at is travel patterns have changed so much since 2019, right? And, and so we really wanna uh, make sure that we're reflecting that so that when we go forward um, with funding new projects or developing the updated uh, RTP that we're sort of 
working from the the best sheet that we can. Can I add a little it. more flavor to that just because I feel yes. like our project selection and kind of general planning framework is a little complicated. There's pluses and minuses to identifying specific projects in, in modal plans. Um, and I think one of the big minuses to me is future flexibility. Um, if you identify a specific list of projects, we're not able to be as nimble when it comes to funding by and pedestrian projects, which all, often are funded not with non-federal funds, honestly, because they're smaller cost projects. <laughs> Folks have a little bit different timelines, right? Like you're not gonna put a sidewalk, just the sidewalk only plan in a 2050 kind of staging period, right? Like that's very far out to be planning a sidewalk project. So we want to make, sh make sure that folks have the flexibility when they're applying for projects. So it's almost better if a project exists within one of our prioritized planning areas, which are, are quite broad as you saw, uh, because you do have more flexibility to apply for them and say they're part of a plan rather than say this specific project is identified in a plan, um, which sometimes you can restrict specific funds to a list of projects that are in a plan, right? Like, and not have the flexibility to do things that are a little bit more ad hoc or a little bit short term in nature, which we tend to see with active transportation projects because they are a little bit smaller scale in nature, um, which is why you'll see in the regional transportation plan, some of those more visionary, like longer, uh, larger investments that are multimodal kind of in nature. They're part of major roadway projects. They're very long trail connections. They're not necessarily those kind of like shorter range projects. So I think strategically, we really wanted to, to keep flexibility for active transportation projects, but lay enough of a framework so that we have identified corridors, we've identified areas for investment to give project sponsors that amount of flexibility so that when they're going after a grant, they can say, this is in this specific area, this is on an identified corridor, rather than say this segment of sidewalk is listed in a in a 2050 plan because the odds are <laughs> probably not going to be. Thank you. Here's why I ask. There's two reasons. One is when I explain that both CDOT and Dr. Cog are replanning their bike pet or active transportation plans, my constituency rolls their eyes. This is sort of more government activity that's difficult to understand. And then if if I sit down, like with Boulder County, for example, and we're, we're critical, the bipartisan infrastructure law is $1.2 trillion. There's a $5 billion carve out for SS4A or bike ped. That's about four tenths of 1% of the total bill. Yeah. So it's a funding problem. Sorry to be a Debbie Downer. No, not at all. And and I think um, to kind of use that as a as a segue. I think one of the you know if 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 we go through um, what the different key elements that we I want to identify, especially under assess Dr. Cog's programs and policies, I think that's where we get into that question of it is exactly right. Like you have to identify funding to, to advance projects. And so started, you know, revisiting, you know, whether it's it's our TIP policy or our different mechanisms, you know, how can we carve out a little bit more of um, of the pie or, or just make it a little bit more programmatic to implement these active transportation um, uh, projects throughout the region because the idea is, is to complete the network. And so, you know, as, as projects, um, Come up in the queue, uh, you know, as as funding is identified, how do we do the best we can to um, to make sure that active transportation is is very much at the center of that um, implementation. So, um, part of the goal, it's a long way of saying, yeah, part of the goal is identifying how to expand funding and, and capacity. Thank you. Wait, can I just say one more thing? Because this is a fun fact. Yeah. Our region has historically invested a lot of money in active transportation in our last four-year tip, I believe 60% of funds, and we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars, were active transportation projects. This is pretty unrivaled when you look at other MPOs and especially like state DOT level breakdowns. That's 40% of all of our tip projects are active transportation projects. And that doesn't even include transit projects that have pedestrian elements. That doesn't include multiple roadway project projects. Um, so we do use this network to invest hundreds of, of millions of dollars. Emily, you're a little muted. Like quiet or muted? 
Maybe it's just me. I would say a little, I would say a little quiet. Um, yeah, I, I can just re, um, I can reaffirm, uh, somebody was saying that, and, and this is very true that, uh, in, um, with the number, did you say 60% or it's 60 or 62? I can't remember. Yeah. Uh, uh of the projects that are, or of the funding that we awarded through our, our tip process was for active transportation projects, um, in the last cycle. So, um, we very much are, are prioritizing active transportation. If, you know, if, if I had my druthers, we would, you know, even continue to, <laughs> um, increase that number. Um, but, um, but yeah, we um, Dr. Cog has you know the, having this planning framework really helps uh, the region um, continue to to push that forward and increase that share that's going towards it, uh, biking and walking. So, um, I did see a question in the chat um, um, that I just wanted to quickly pick up, which is. I had shown this graphic um, and the question was basic, uh, what is basic sidewalk? Um, so the um, this is based on planimetric data, which is sort of uh, aerial photography translated. Um, so it's, I, I just wanna, you know, it's, it's pretty good data, but I, I wanna make that caveat that it's not like field verified. Um, and what we say when we say basic sidewalk is, is anything that complies with the uh, public right of way uh, access guidelines. So um, essentially four feet or greater. Um, so, you know, could uh, a, a single user using a wheelchair or mobility device uh, uh, traverse this sidewalk? And so that's what you see when you see basic sidewalks. Um, and this is really just a, pl a planning tool um, to try to understand what the general coverage is. Um, and uh, I think we said social sidewalk is is enough for people to walk side by side, so eight feet. Um, I'm going to quickly run through the scope elements because I want to make sure we have time uh, to get into our planning themes exercise and, and have some conversation. Um, so the key elements of the extra transportation plan, um, we want to do, we're, we're really focusing on um, member and stakeholder capacity, uh, develop, building member and stakeholder capacity. So spending a lot of time convening our member governments and partners um, to really uh, um, uh, share practices and, and um, try to build a lot of momentum around this. Um, but we also want to uh, conduct uh, inclusive and substantive engagement. I really want to underline those words. Um, one of the things that we really want to be focused on in how we do engagement is is thinking, you know, we we talk a lot about in this in this field about the curb cut uh, effect, right? Of of designing uh, something that is targeted to a specific population that's experiencing a barrier with using a system uh, is is a great way to develop solutions that improve um, systems for all people, right? So uh, building a curb cut or a curb ramp into a sidewalk specifically is meant to accommodate people using wheelchairs and mobility devices, but everybody uses curb ramps. This is uh, sort of what we're thinking about is in the same way we want to identify um, um, people experiencing barriers to using active transportation and conducting really deep engagement with the um, with people who want to but aren't able to, you know. So we'll talk a little bit about that more later, but I just really wanted to hit that point that when we think about engagement, uh, because of where Dr. Cog uh, is sort of situated and how we work with our partners, we really want to be uh, sort of targeted in in developing those solutions that um, that benefit everyone. So uh, we're really focused on that piece. We want to update the regional action transportation network. Uh, one of the big things that we've that we've kicked off and are starting um, to work on and lay the groundwork for is guidance to accelerate completion of. Uh, the regional pedestrian network, and so thinking about you know how much of uh, how much work there is to uh, to be done to upgrade um, upgrade or build new sidewalks uh, across the region so we have complete coverage. Uh, we really want to develop um, some guidance to to help advance that. Um, updated guidance for emerging micromobility design and infrastructure. So thinking about all the new types of uh, micromobility vehicles, so scooters. Um, e-bikes, cargo bikes, different things that are, are using public facilities and, and are really proliferating very quickly. We want to uh, develop some guides from that uh, because with sort of new modes and new technologies comes conflicts and um, and just some growing pain. So we really want to um, 
uh, help get our hands around that. We want to analyze the economic benefits of active transportation investments. So this will be a, a specific analysis to do a little bit of storytelling around what are some of the um, the values and 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 benefits of uh, biking and walking across the region. Uh, that piece about assess, assessing Dr. Cog programs and policies, and then finally producing an actionable plan. So those are the major scope items of uh, the timeline. Um, we uh, this you know so, uh, we're approaching the end of the summer and and we're really doing um, our sort of uh, initial outreach um, and then starting to develop the the planning framework um, and starting to develop that uh, active transportation network. This fall and winter is is really when we're. Um, ramping up a lot of work with stakeholders and, and community members to understand those barriers that I was talking about to universal design and active transportation. Um, so we'll hit all those different deliverables and really get those going uh, this fall and winter and then spring and summer um, of next year are when we're really developing recommendations uh, and delivering the plan. And so we've given ourselves about an 18 month horizon um, to deliver this plan because we want to make sure to take our time and um, and uh, and and have some really good engagement and conversations and and process around that. But so that's that's kind of the general overview for the plan. Um, before we jump into the activity, are there any questions about that? Piece, those two pieces. I'll try to check the chat box as well. All right. So uh, plan themes. And this is really an opportunity. I'm going to invite people to to um, to unmute, to uh, to jump in, or to drop in uh, comments in the chat box. Um, but really, this is sort of what we think of as as the overarching plan framework. Um, you know, what are the um, I'm I'm trying to avoid saying goals, but what are what are the things that should guide our plan? Uh, what are the overarching themes for walking and bicycling and micro mobility that um, that really should be our north star? Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of background. I'm going to tell you about uh, some of the engagement that we did with uh, cities and towns and counties um, to try to understand uh, sort of their priorities. And then I'm going to share some draft themes that we've come up with and uh, hopefully just ground truth them with you all, say that this is resonant, this is important, we're missing that, um, things like that. And, and, and we'll just kind of do some work to... Um, to refine those together, but I, I wanted to start by uh, just getting some input uh, before we get uh, uh, far down the path to make sure that we're we're on the right path. So um, just uh, for starters, um, I, I really like this. We, we were able to get out on Bike to Work Day at the end of June. Um, we put together these cards where we asked people, walking makes me feel or biking makes me feel and had them fill in different answers. It was it was very uh, cute and and had some wonderful uh, engaged uh, cyclists um, and and this is just a word cloud of, of what they came up with. Uh, you know, people said that biking and walking make them feel free, make them feel happy, alive, strong, fast, awesome, youthful, empowered. Um, I, I love all these words, um, and I feel like those probably resonate with many of us. Um, additionally, uh, so we. Uh, we had a meeting with our member government advisory group um, and asked them a few questions. We asked, why is walking important to you? Why is it important to people uh, living in your jurisdiction? And how important are, are different themes or ideas? Um, uh, and, and really what came out um, of that conversation was an emphasis on enjoyment, on uh, exercise, um, uh, safety, of course, um, and then uh, being out in the environment, accessibility being an important uh, driver, um, and what you can access when you're walking, um, and then sense of community um, was sort of an interesting takeaway. So we're going to focus on walking first, and I'm going to take you through some of the draft themes um, that we developed based on that conversation um, and based on community conversations, um, and just kind of get your sense on um, what sounds good what lands um and you know what um what we might be missing or want to talk about um and so this will guide every aspect of uh developing the actual plan products so first of all keeping pedestrians safe means safe streets 
And so this is a big one that always comes forward. Um, the Denver region, as with the nation, um, is in the in the midst of a pedestrian safety crisis. That pedestrian uh, deaths and injuries are increasing very uh, quickly. Um, and and so uh, that's really at the center of all of this is is the basic safety to move. Um, second, a complete connected pedestrian network is foundational for equitable travel. So we talked a lot about gaps in the network. Um, having that you know complete and continuous um, uh, travel is is really uh, key, and that's really at the center of of you know uh, groups that have been historically marginalized are often the ones who are most subject to those gaps um, and, and broken connections in the pedestrian network. Um, don't force pedestrians to swim between the islands. This is something that we've heard a lot and have observed a lot, that there are these little sort of neighborhood pockets of connectivity um, for people to walk and where they feel safe and comfortable walking, but then those are bounded by large um, arterial streets and, and major connections. Um, so it often feels like you have these islands of connectivity that you're kind of swimming between, right? That you're you're swimming across uh, large amounts of traffic. And so bridging some of those uh, those barriers is, is really central. Um, great pedestrian facilities anchor great places. Um, again, that, you know, uh, um, social and community wealth building is, is based on, um, is, is sort of rooted in infrastructure and in that um, places that are comfortable and inviting to walk um, are places that people want to be. Um, accessible walking networks support social travel, that people walk together, um, uh, that um, we want systems that, that provide uh, movement in the way that people want to move. And then finally, uh, pedestrians are the most uh, sensitive to environmental experience, uh, which is to say that, you know, in inclement weather or, um, uh, you know, when it, as we have more extreme heat events and, um, and ozone days and things like that, that pedestrians are really sensitive um, to that uh, experience as they're sort of the first to lose access and the last to get it back. Um, so those are, that's kind of where we started. Um, and I want to pull open the chat. Um, and so Jill made a comment in the chat that the the results from, I'm, I'm guessing this is the, uh, the member government um, advisory group. Um, so these results seem like they might be biased towards people who walk bike for recreation than, rather than those who depend um, uh, to get the daily destinations. Uh, perhaps because driving is not an option. I think that's absolutely true, and you can definitely observe that. Um, and so maybe um, I'll open it up um, to the group on um, are we capturing the universe of of people who walk uh, both for recreation and enjoyment, but also because it's it's core transportation. So yeah, go ahead. That's a a, a key demographic that you're not going to hear from in traditional community meetings or online surveys. And I think it's it'll be really critical as part of your community engagement to get out and do like intercept interviews with people who are walking on mm -hmm. streets like Federal Boulevard to understand mm -hmm. why are they there? What are their needs? What would make their daily transportation experience better? And it just, it seemed like that person's needs was not really reflected in the, the government survey of what's most important about walking is that it's enjoyable. Like a lot of people just walk because that's the, the form of transportation that's available to them. A hundred percent. It's, um, I'm really glad you flagged that. It is a huge consideration. I think it's one of those things that we'll circle back when we talk about sort of the engagement next steps. So I want to pin that comment. Um, um, but yeah, it's 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 hugely critical that you know that that we are doing our desktop work and we're thinking and we're trying to think deeply about you know what does a great system look like and until you've had that experience of trying to push a grocery cart or a stroller on a you know on a narrow attached sidewalk, it's <laughs> it's not going to hit home <laughs> in the same way. Um, so uh, yes, just just want to echo that comment and thank you. Um, and related to that, I would just add, I feel like a theme that's missing here on this slide is the importance of directness of routing for mm. people walking. That if you are relying on walking as a form of transportation, you don't want to be forced to go out of your way 
to get to the bus stop right across the street or to get to the grocery store or the destination. And I think that's often what happens. We're like, well, we'll just give people this nice bridge to get over Federal Boulevard, but it's going to add five or 10 minutes to their walking route in order to do that. And in order to, for walking to really function as a form of transportation, directness of routing is really important. Absolutely. Um, I will, I'll ask uh, Nora um, if you can make sure to capture that in the notes. I, I don't want to exit out and start typing, but I think that's that's a great piece of input, um, that directness piece. Yeah. Um, let's see. I'm going to call, uh, Michaela uh, made a comment. There's a lack of shade when you walk around. Uh, this has a huge impact where are trees in Denver. Um, Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, and I, I think we're all feeling that acutely. And, and so that's actually, it, it's something that maybe we can better enumerate in the plan themes um, is those specific environmental factors. Um, I think that's something that we'd, um, we'd like to keep uh, open as a guidance topic is, um, you know, how do you deliver that supportive infrastructure and and i think that's sort of a, a good way to think about it is you know trees are supportive infrastructure because they make walking pleasant or even tolerable on you know 100 degree days um if michaela feel free to to jump in if, if you had any more to add to that um oh and i want to call out it looks like there are a couple comments um from Elaine and Michaela and, uh, and Jean about uh, maintenance. And we are a, a four season region. Um, so Elaine said in my area, I noticed poorly designed curb cuts. They work uh, in fine weather, but when it's wet or snowy, they can accumulate snow, ice, or water. Um, how can we improve the quality of curb cuts so they remain usable in poor weather? And yeah, and, and I just want to, um, Underline that, that that idea of pedestrians are the most sensitive to environmental experience that um, when you're entering a crossing, you know, and, and the drainage is right there at the corner as well. Um, it's, it's really unpleasant. It's not great um, to walk through those uh, giant ponds and, and puddles um, to cross the street. And so, um, yeah, can I weigh in a little more on that? Because um, absolutely, part of, part of what I'm getting at is there are design flaws in you know how the curb cuts were were placed because they were such an oh we need to add it to this one corner where they weren't previously and all of a sudden we had a pooling problem so it was never designed you know in the first place to allow for the drainage to happen so you know, here's like, let's build a curb cut because we need it. It's a three-way intersection. And, you know, there were options that a wheelchair user made, you know, yes, they'd go out of the way, but I kept feeling like this is crazy because I am um, kind of transit and bike reliant. I, you know, I we're a one car family. So I'm always walking to my bus or whatever. And when I see that, it's like, Wow. Um, but, you know, same thing. My, the sidewalk I walk on to get to transit is immediately adjacent to the road. So that begs that maintenance issue that somebody goes out and plows the sidewalk, but then they come and plow the road and the um, snow plow is pushing it up on the sidewalk. And that's the really, really bad quality kind of snow to put on a sidewalk. So, um, you know, what What are we doing for wheelchair users? Because there is a guy in my neighborhood who works in town and it breaks my heart that I see him get in a vehicle to go half a mile to work because he cannot rely on using his wheelchair in that kind of weather. 100%. 100%. So, yeah, I, I think that's something that maybe we can underlining the themes. One thing I do want to call out is, is as part of that sidewalk um, delivery guide that we talked about in the scope, we actually do have a section carved out specifically on operations and maintenance. And we're really excited to dig in on like best practices and in, in plowing or, or snow uh, removal um, for those specific things. And then the other thing that we're really focused on is that universal design piece of just like, what are some of the basic 
uh, design um, needs to for accessible uh, walking facilities. And so talking about corner and curb cut designs and sidewalk width and things like that. So um, uh, I'm, I'm excited to hear that echoed because that's something that we are intending to spend a lot of time on um, and think about a lot. So um, that's great to hear. And then um, just calling out, um, let's see, Eric says, great theme, safety is number one priority for us, which all, yeah, it all seems to go back to, all these go back to safety in some way or another, absolutely. Um, let's see, um, I, I might, I'm gonna read yours really quick. Uh, Charlie, Charlie, I, I'm gonna pin your comment and come back to it because we're about to talk about bikes. So, um, so I'm, I'll, I'll circle back to that. And then, uh, Jean, uh, to your question, uh, how's the Carter Center for the Blind uh, been engaged in this process for design elements? Um, they are a stakeholder that um, I've done some cold outreach to, but uh, have not had a chance to connect with them. But um, if, if you've worked with them, um, I think we'll circle back to that. But uh, would love to uh, specifically engage um, with groups who have different types of disabilities. Um, so um, yes, yes, that would be wonderful. I appreciate that, Jane. Thank you. Um, and so I'm gonna um, I'm gonna pin that and make sure to to come back um, on sort of next steps for those engagement connections. So I think we'll we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, Anything else on planned themes for walking? I want to make sure we give enough time to the bike themes. Right. Um, so very similar um, to uh, walking. What did we see um, when we asked people, why is bicycling important to you? This is among our member governments. Um, you know, again, uh, echoing fun, exercise, freedom, it's efficient, it's faster than walking. Um, why is it important to people living in your jurisdiction? Um, recreation, exercise, freedom, commuting, um, a mention of equity. And I, I kind of want to underline that in the context of Jill's point that there are, there are different reasons to bike. We have a large culture um, here of people, by, you know, bicycling for recreation and for fun and going up and and doing lookout mountain or, or table or you know any of those um but it's also core transportation and people uh with different um with different needs different um economic backgrounds and, and access to transportation options are going to bike for very different reasons um and then when we asked how important are each of the following themes to you uh, in the decision to bike um uh safety exercise enjoyment accessibility um and environment. So um, getting into the um, design or the, the plan themes, design for all ages, all abilities and all capabilities. Um, so this, I, I think a lot of us have probably encountered the design for all ages and abilities um, sort of term or framework, you know, that we want to think about um, the large riding population of people at different ages, different life stages, people with different physical abilities. And then uh, we wanted to differentiate between ability and capability, you know, that these can can often get a little lumped together, that there's confidence or um, level of comfort bicycling, but then there's also um, physical ability and, and, and barriers to, um, to using uh, micromobility. Um, and so we want to uh, differentiate those different needs. Um, Bicycling offers fast, reliable travel without congestion. It's um, it's efficient. Um, high comfort bikeways are continuous and connected again. Um, and then one thing I wanted to call out is the Denver region is a hub of bicycling innovation that um, in the last five years, especially, you know, the prolifer proliferation of things like e-bike rebates and different design tools um, that, that our local governments are starting to deploy. Um, and then we just have this history of, you know, the the bicycle share marking was invented in Denver. And, you know, I'm sure that people have mixed feelings about that, but um, that we just sort of have this history of um, of being innovative about bicycling and micromobility, and, and we should really um, own that and be proud of that. 
Um, and then finally, local networks, re regional corridors that we're sort of trying to match this overlapping mesh of short trips, purpose-driven trips, um, you know, school to the grocery to work, but then also these regional corridors that serve these much longer uh, types of needs. Um, so those are sort of the overarching uh, themes. I want to circle back and make sure to give Charlie the floor first, uh, since I skipped you last time. Um, and so you you called out that good uh, regional bike routes cross through many jurisdictions and that inter uh, jurisdiction coordination um, is a real hang up. Um, um, yeah, let's see. And then you mentioned specifically uh, a corridor that that you and Matt have been uh, uh, working on uh, on US ninety three or on Colorado ninety three um, between Golden and Boulder. Um, is there anything you wanted to add to that, uh, Charlie? I just want to make sure to give you a floor. Oh, thanks a lot for that. Um, yeah, just on the communication aspect, it just seems with so many of our regional bike routes, it, it, various public works um, departments do need to get together. And I'm finding with various projects, uh, it stops at their boundaries. And uh, just Dr. Cog is in quite a special role of being able to kind of bring uh, different jurisdictions together. So I, I just um, think that's a, a good process and just one that should be urged uh, to for others to, for these municipalities to think in those terms and not just uh, according to their boundaries, that's all. Um, and then Matt may have some more uh, to say about the Colorado 93 bikeway. Um, it is gaining interest and it is uh, really what could be uh, intermodal um, transportation corridor, one that's very important. So um, I don't know, Matt, do you have any more to say on it as a boulder height on, on the representing that area? Thanks, Charlie. I'm already using Dr. Cog's time on that. So we could talk yeah, about it some other time. <laughs> that's right. You have weighed in pretty pretty strongly on that part. But at any rate, um, the, I guess the point too was um, with the new planner, the revised planner, are we looking at uh, expansion of some of the corridors and and um, you know going a little further with with what's possible. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, so we'll be revisit, revisiting uh, the, um, of course, the region wide network. And and one thing that I'll call out um, just to sort of like finding what Dr. Cog's niche is within it. Um, not every corridor that's necessarily on a local bike plan is going to appear on our regional corridors. And that's kind okay. of why we, um, why we have the three part framework so we can try to capture, you know, like, um, what are those those core regional routes, you know, um, that are really significant, that carry a lot of capacity, that should be higher comfort? And what are things that fit better into those district designations, you know, so they they can still access funding opportunities, they can still include those in their their plans, um, um, and they're not precluded from that. But we also like, you know, we don't want a map that is like impossible to to use or decipher. Like we want to make sure to. Um, build in that flexibility and, and really emphasize like what are those core routes that Dr. Cog can really support. Um, and and just to your comment, I think that's a great comment about that inner, you know, inner jurisdictional coordination that maybe that needs to be emphasized. Um, like I'm looking at, you know, the theme number three that could be maybe remolded to really emphasize that the purpose of the plan is, is sort of seamless connection. Um, yeah. Uh, and and just improve coordination. Um, and then, oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, um, that sounds great. And um, I think all five are really good and um, underscoring number three. Uh, I think um, it does seem uh, some of our engineers in, in the uh, public works departments do need a little push or if Dr. Cog could sort of say now, this is what you need to think about. And so in that terms of going across boundaries. Uh, yeah. So uh, just points well taken. 
appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'm going to just keep running down the list. Uh, Jill mm -hmm. uh, had a comment about how e-bikes deserve their own theme. Um, they expand the type of people who choose to bike and the types of trips that people choose to bike for. Um, couldn't agree more. Um, and yeah, I think that you're probably right that maybe maybe number four is a little wonky. Um, <laughs> and and we could maybe condense that to, to sort of better pinpoint um, e-bikes, cargo bikes, how those, those sort of new uh, or more proliferating modes of transportation are really, you know, opening up um, uh, bicycling to a wider population. Speaking as a person with a cargo bike that I call our family minivan, that it really mm -hmm. changes, you know, the kinds of trips you can take and, and sort of reduces barriers um, uh, for people biking. Uh, E-bikes for deliveries uh, could also be its own theme. How does this relate uh, to Dr. Cox planning for freight and commercial deliver deliveries more generally? Um, it's a point well taken um, around working cyclists um, and bikes. Dr. Cog is also planning to do a freight plan. I think over, I think in 2025 is when that's going to start. Um, so we'll be coordinating between the two, uh, but that's a good point um, to maybe incorporate that into the overarching themes. Um, and then uh, Michaela made a point about for both walking and biking, specifically targeting areas around schools. Um, I think this is a, uh, a great point and maybe something we could call out a little more explicitly. I think a lot about how do we, uh, as a region, plan for children and families and, and people at different life stages. I think children and older adults are, are sort of the two core age-based populations that, that we sort of think of as um, either being reliant on biking on active transportation because children cannot get driver's licenses and <laughs> um, um, our, our key de demographic, but also unlocking that sort of travel at all ages and and uh, identifying those barriers that those groups uh, encounter. Um, so maybe that needs a, a more specific call out. Call out. Um, let's see. Um, I am going to triage a little bit. Um, uh, let's see. Um, in this plan, how are nest neighborhoods factored in? What is the equity, equity lens and how is it prioritized? Uh, we're going to jump to that, Michaela, in just a second. Uh, Dr. Cog does use an equity index, which ba is based on some demographic factors as, as sort of a core planning uh, component. Um, and that we'll, we'll use that in, in a lot of the analysis and things. But then um, how um, are we leveraging our, our equity lens and our, our equity priorities? Um, we'll talk a little bit about that in engagement. Um, Let's see, Jill, I see you have your hand raised. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna give you the floor. Um, and these chat comments are wonderful. And I just wanna make sure, maybe we can do one last comment from Jill and then I'm gonna move on to the last slides if that's okay. Yeah, I just wanted to mention related to local networks and regional corridors. Um, I think Denver is developing a really interesting concept of a core network within its bike network, which is really intended to be like the arterial corridors within that network mm -hmm. that are fast, direct, high capacity routes that people can take longer distances if they're trying to get across the city. And so as Denver is developing that concept, I think it'd be interesting to think about how does that core network expand across municipal boundaries um, which is really focused on transportation, the transportation value of biking, whereas other regional networks might be more recreational, you know, that are for tourists or people who are using them on the weekend. And so I think those are two distinct ways to think about what does a regional corridor mean? Absolutely. Um, yeah, we are 100%. Um, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll second that comment. And and I think it's it is going to be a really important distinction as as we develop this that there are important recreation corridors and then there are important transportation corridors. So that's a great comment. Um, so what I'm I'm just going to summarize. Uh, we have the chat captured and thank you all for all your comments. Um, I think to summarize, what I'd like to do with these plan themes is just make them a little bit more specific and concrete. There are a lot of comments about. Um, walking and bicycling to local destinations and what some of those are. And I, I, I think it would probably be worthwhile to even spell that out and, and to sort of prioritize some of those destinations um, um, uh, in, in these overarching themes. 
Um, oh, technology is a great point. Uh, yep, Boulder similarly has a, a core arterial network that's really tied to safety and their safety goals. Um, so um, uh, these are all great points. All right, I wanna make sure um, before uh, we let you all go at 12, um, <laughs> that we get to talk about what's next. So for next steps for engagement, I'm, I'm going to make a little uh, clarifying note that um, uh, we were we wanted to make sure to have this meeting before the end of August because uh, I'm personally planning to go out on leave uh, for two months. So I'll be back uh, at the end of October. So my colleague Emily is going to be sort of the, the key point of contact for this plan for the next two months. Um, uh, but uh, at some point after I come back, um, is sort of our next plan to, to reconvene a community advisory group um, in late fall or early winter 2024. And at that point, we're, we're uh, intending to or anticipating starting to, to talk with you all about the network planning exercise. Um, um, so just keep an eye on that. And then one of the things that I really want to focus on and sort of put the ask out to this group today is when we get into that deep engagement, you all have given us a lot of um, uh, input on this. Um, we want to have really targeted focus groups um, in different types of locations with really targeted topics and um, want to crowdsource some ideas around who should be involved in these focus groups. So I've listed out like a, a few key topic areas, and then I'll just tell you what we're thinking, um, and we can kind of ground truth this quickly. So universal design and accessibility, this gets into that, um, how do we design sidewalks and intersections and travel ways uh, for people um, uh, with different abilities and, and types of disabilities. And so I think the focus for that is actually to be very uh, intentional about pulling apart what are the different, what are, you know, one disability is not like another. So what is it like for someone who's blind or low vision to, um, to use the, um, the transportation network? What is it like for someone using a wheelchair mobility device? Um, and then of course, children and families. I also think about that, that signing for children and families, um, as specific users with targeted needs. Um, emerging bicycle and micromobility options, again, talking to different types of cyclists um, uh, who use bikes for core transportation. Um, so, you know, understanding whether people who are, are working cyclists or again, engaging with uh, groups in historically marginalized communities who have higher bike utilization because they um, uh, uh, may have decreased vehicle access. Um, so again, think, thinking of some of those um, sort of uh, demographic identity factors, um, and then some of the specific groups, and then finally sidewalk program expansion, uh, we'd like to engage with, you know, there have been a lot of um, innovations in, in how sidewalk uh, programs are funded and delivered, and so we'd like to sort of expand that conversation um, a little bit. So uh, maybe I'll put the ask out to you all. Um, that um, if you have sort of thoughts right now about um, who to engage for those different focus groups, I think that's where we would really like to make our big engagement push. So with one minute over, um, uh, any, any last thoughts to add? And I'm gonna put my contact information up uh, at the end. Um, Finally, we have a website. It's engage.drcog.org slash ATP. I'll make sure to send this around in a, in a follow-up email, but we'll be posting project updates, including this meeting um, to that engagement site. Um, so uh, feel free to, um, to explore that site, to register for updates, to send it to anyone you know that has questions. Um, and then I um, will include this in, in, uh, as we pass it around, but CDOT is also updating the statewide active transportation plan. So if you're interested in getting involved, um, you can contact Annalise Van Bono. Um, I'll, uh, I'll follow up with, with her information since we're rushing through this, but they're working on that on a similar timeline. And so that covers state roadways um, and the straight transportation network. Um, and yeah, thank you all for taking the time today. I'm gonna hang out for a few minutes, but recognize that people have to jump. Um, but thank you for taking the time and uh, for offering your input. This has been invaluable. Um, and uh, we look forward to working with you all uh, this fall and winter uh, even more.
Aaron, you, 